to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you could join us today. In this episode, Pastor Jeremy is teaching on how to win the fight of faith. We believe this message is going to strengthen, encourage you, and can change your life forever. Let's head in there right now. There's a massive difference in knowing, hey, I'm in a fight of faith and knowing how to win the fight of faith. There's a big difference, and it should not be that across the board, so many Christians lose every time the doctor diagnoses them with some kind of disease or something happens. It should not be that across the board there's so many losses. We should win. Now remember, the fight of faith is not so much fighting against the devil as fighting for what Jesus purchased for you. And the enemy and his plan is to keep you from what Jesus purchased. So there are times that you do have to go on the offensive in this fight of faith. And I want to talk a little bit about that uh, again today. Hopefully you've received something. How many of you could just wave your hand and say, Pastor, I've received something from this series that's helped tweak me. Praise God. There are certain battles that you will face in life that you're going to have to go all in on if you want to win. I don't know why it is that way, and maybe when we get to heaven, the Lord will show us that. But, you know, understanding why that is, we don't really need to understand there as much as just obeying the Word of God. Understanding follows obedience. That's the order of things in the kingdom. I hope you caught that. Understanding follows obedience in the kingdom of God. It's not the other way around. People want it the other way around, and and it doesn't work that way. Let me just tell you this. If you will lay out before the Lord, literally, you can lay down if you want. Lay out before the Lord. But I want you to spiritually examine yourself. And if you're in a fight, especially for your life, ask the Lord, where is it, Lord, that there's an open door? And let me just say, If you seek the Lord like that and you get real with God, he'll show you if there's an open door. And you've got to be willing to receive that from your heavenly father because he loves you. Now, there are people that die sick and it happens every day and they go straight to heaven. So don't ever misunderstand anything in a message like what I'm preaching today. That if you die sick, you're not going to heaven. That's not true. Okay? You're going to heaven. But the Lord wants his saints to live a long, healthy, prosperous life. Third John 2 should settle that for you. Okay, I guess some of you are looking at me that way. I'm just going to turn to my Bible. See, I've got a Bible. No one can take this from me. I know what it says without looking, but I'm going to look. It says, Beloved. Oh, Third John. It only has one chapter, so it's chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved. Anytime I see beloved or brethren, I know that's written to a Christian. That's written to me. I pray that you would prosper in all things and be in health. Health. Everybody say health. health. Just as your soul prospers. The Lord wants you healthy. The Lord wants you to prosper. So once you know that and you say, okay, I'll just take that. I'll take God at his word. Now you lay out before the Lord and say, Lord, I know that's your will. If I'm not experiencing that, I want to know why. And hold nothing back. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with the Lord. He already knows the truth. And if you'll stay willing to repent, willing to do what's right, willing to maybe even cut off a relationship, sad to say, I wish it wasn't that way. But I'm talking about winning the fight of faith. If you want to win, there might be some things like this required of you. Now, we've established in here that Jesus... He already paid for our healing. In this series, we've looked at this. He always leads us to triumph, so therefore, he's paid for our triumph over every scheme of the devil. And you need to know today, there's good news. If you feel trapped, if you feel like you're being tempted and you might even want to give up, remember that Jesus is the way maker. Remember that. Why do I say that? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, say, thank God for the Word. The The Holy Spirit told Paul to write and to tell everyone to look at and remember what happened to the children of Israel. They're our examples. And right after he's done talking about that, he says, no temptation in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation, not one, has overtaken you 
except such as is common to man. So here's what you need to know. What you're facing, there are others that face this. Now, some people have gotten aggravated with me because I deal with a whole bunch of different situations, and sometimes I'll be inspired to bring one of those situations up right here, and people will say, wait a minute, you're talking about me. But here's what you need to know. If you're dealing with something, there's more than likely several someones in here dealing with the exact same thought pattern, with the exact same details of what you're dealing with. Why do I say that? Because of this scripture. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Somebody else has faced the temptation you're right in the middle of. Let me tell you a common one. I just give up. I tried this. It's not working. That's a common temptation. And that's common to man. But, I like this part, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful. Somebody say amen. amen. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will also make the Pay close attention. The way of escape. That you may be able to bear it. Wow, I like that. God always makes a way to escape. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Maybe you hadn't been through some things I've been through. I find that to be really good news. He makes a way of escape. If the building's on fire, wouldn't you want to take the way to escape the flames? Well, this is no different. We're talking about eternal flames, though. He's made a way to escape not only that, but every temptation that you'll ever face, he's made the way of escape. Let me just say, there's no other way to escape except his way. See, that's the problem. When we live in this culture where people say, oh, everyone's a child of God, seeking their own way to God the Father. Well, that won't work. Jesus said, I am the way. Not a way, the way. I'm always reminded of the story Pastor Ricky, our founding pastor, has told about when he dealt with some Jehovah's Witnesses one time, and he was talking to him about this, and he tried to get him to repeat after him and say that Jesus is Lord. And they said Jesus is a Lord. No, no, no. See, there's a big difference, and you've got to pay attention to this. Jesus is the Lord and Savior. The very first time we came uh, to check out Accelerate, um, I believe my husband came with me that very first time, um, and I knew that that's what I wanted. I knew that's what I knew that that's where I was called. Um, so, me and the kids continued to come back um, every Sunday and every Wednesday. I remember women were thinking that I was the single mom because my husband wasn't there, but I remained faithful and I kept coming. I would say at that point, our marriage was rocky. Um, I know that had we not stopped or started coming to church, I wouldn't be married today. That was something that I didn't ask him and wake him up every morning and say, you coming this time? Or, you know, Wednesday, you coming today? I just kept coming and I'd say, hey, we're going to church. See you later. And like I said, I remained faithful. I prayed for him. And it was like this one empty seat, like one day he's going to fill this seat. <laughs> uh -huh. So that morning was just like our normal chaotic Sunday morning, getting ready to go. Um, I was in the kitchen, you know, getting the kids breakfast and stuff ready and walked back into my room where my husband was normally still asleep and he was up putting on a button up shirt and I remember him just, oh, sorry. <laughs> I remember him buttoning his shirt up that morning and I knew he wasn't going to the gym because he was wearing a button up shirt. So I was like, well, where are you going? And he said, I'm coming with you to church. So I said, okay. And then I walked out, I was like, praise the Lord, he's coming. <laughs> you know, after my husband came to church with me um, after those months, I was, I think we were at home after church and I said, well, what caused you to come like with us to church? And he said, honestly, I've seen a change in you and I wanted what you have. I would say right around that time, um, I thought my marriage was over. And that statement alone was confirmation that it's not. And 
for him to see that change in me because I kept showing up. Now he keeps showing up and my kids keep showing up. And now we have his little brother. I would say like my personal little motto for anything is keep showing up. And I continually showed up. I didn't care that people thought I was a single mom or that I didn't have a husband at home. But one thing I would not do, Um, don't nag them, just pray for them and they'll show up. And that's, that's another thing too, it, you showing up and being faithful is going to change the trajectory of everyone behind you and everyone after you because one little thing that I had in my mind to remain determined and to keep showing up, it changed my family. It brought me and my husband closer together. It has really strengthened our family. Like I said, we have custody of his little brother now. So now we're changing his trajectory and those after him. We have custody of my stepdaughter. We're changing the trajectory of her life. So you remaining faithful and diligent is going to affect more than just you. He's the same one that's made a way of escape. Now listen to me. If he's made a way of escape, then I've got to ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. Will you take the way of escape? Will you? Some of you will not win until you decide to take the escape route out of that sin. Out of that unforgiveness. See how I say this? It's like sometimes I say things, I feel like I might as well talk to this glass over here. At least I'd be able to see my own face and maybe amen myself if I saw myself. God has made a way of escape. Are you going to take that way, though? See, that's, that's the question on this side of heaven. Are you going to take the way of escape? See, God never takes your choice away from you. I get tickled, man. I mean, come on, people, you got to be kidding me. People get under the influence of a demon, and, and it's across the world. My pastor's telling me this is across the world. They get disgruntled with the local church. They leave, and the first thing they want to say is it's a cult. This happens all over the world in all different languages. So get your mind off Amarillo. This happens all over the whole world. They all say the same thing. Why? The demons have always said the same thing. Anywhere there's divine order place, which is a local church, where God has a set man there to carry the authority in that local church, people don't like that when they want to do things their way. And they bump into that authority. So the easiest way to do it that the enemy's planned is to say, that's cultish. Well, cult is just a short word for culture. Every church does have a culture. Every nation of the world has a culture. The kingdom of God has a culture about it. And the thing about the kingdom of God is you either do it his way or you hit the old highway and do it your way. And I decided since I got this heavenly call by God to pastor in this end time hour, then I'm going to do this his way. His way doesn't really care about how many empty seats are up in the place. Because he's building his church. You want to know how many people he's called by his name to come and assemble this morning? More than could fit into every church building in this city. But as you can see, most people don't hear his voice. Therefore, they don't know his way of escape. Therefore, they don't win. See, I'm talking to you about how to win the fight of faith. And if you're going to win, you better take the way of escape. The next verse, I like it. I referred to it oh, a couple months ago in a, in a sermon, but I don't remember the last time I pulled the scripture up. It says, therefore, my beloved, anytime you see beloved or brethren, it's written right to a Christian. Look what he says. Flee from idolatry. <laughs> see, the average Bible reader will be like, well, what does that have to do with the scripture before? Everything. You see, idolatry is not just you making a carved image and bowing down to it and worshiping a carved image. That's foolishness. And there are people in this world that do that, and all of them are wrong. But in America, you want to know what it is? It's anything you place before God. That's actually the meaning of idolatry. Something has taken first place. Notice, that could be a spouse. 
That could be a child. That could be a, a parent. That could be a family member, a friend you've had your whole life. That could be almost anything, because it is. Anything that takes first place over Jesus is an idol. And your Bible in the New Testament is not making a suggestion, but a command to a New Testament Christian to flee from idolatry. Here's the point. That's your way of escape. Joseph, in the Old Testament, found himself in a position where Potiphar's wife, day after day, the Bible tells us, was said, come and lie with me. To the point she got so aggressive, she went and put her hands on him. Come lie with me. And she probably wasn't the ugliest Egyptian out there. Because Potiphar worked for Pharaoh. I mean, these were like big timers back there in Egypt. Right? She said, come lie with me. Come lie with me. Come lie with me. She had her a lust problem. An idol problem. Right? Joseph didn't. And his way of escape was to run without his outer garment. I don't know. I've read different scholars. I don't know if he was completely naked or not. doesn't really matter. He had to run. And there is a key to this. If you want the victory, there will be some things you are going to have to just flat out run from. And if you don't run, then what's going to happen? The enemy gets access into your life, and slowly but surely, he's willing to play the long game plan. He'll whittle away what God's doing in your life and get you to forget all that God has done. You see, if anything or anyone has first place in your life, that thing is an idol. You're in idolatry. This is one big, huge reason people don't win. If you want to win the fight of faith, You've got to make sure Jesus is first place. And once you have him in first place, and most of you probably do because this is the first day of the week, Sunday morning, here you are in a remnant church, so I'm not getting on you. I just think, praise God, you're starting out good. You got him in first place. Now you got to keep him there. Now, once he's in first place, I want to talk to all of you that would tell me, yeah, Pastor, I've got Jesus in first place. Let me just ask, how many of you would say Jesus is first place in my life? Raise your hand boldly. Now, I know if you can't raise your hand, he's probably not, but I'm not really counting. I'm just saying, okay, that's the majority of hands in this, in this room. Majority of people watching, probably listening by radio right now. Okay, with that being the case, I wanted to set all that up to qualify this. Let me ask you another question. How long are you willing to put up with sickness? How long are you willing to put up with pain? How long are you willing to put up with defeat or hurt feelings? How long will you put up with it? because that's gonna determine a lot about whether or not you win in this fight of faith. You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. A lot of people are spending time praying for God to do something when they need to be doing something else besides praying. I'm not against prayer. You better pray. But the worst time for you to get religious about, oh, everyone pray, 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 is when you need to use your mouth to curse, curse, curse sickness from the roots. See, all that praying in the world ain't going to do any good to you curse. Listen to me. I'm talking about how to live and not die. I'm talking about how to win the fight of faith. Some people don't get this. God's going to use you, and all he can use is the words you speak. He's the high priest of your confession. So you better get to saying the right thing. But let me show you once again, Ephesians chapter 1. Say, thank God for the word. Ephesians 1, therefore I also... Verse 15, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, Ephesians 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This is what I pray over all the partners of Accelerate Church on a very consistent basis, I pray this. The eyes of your understanding would be opened and enlightened. 
that you would know what the hope of his calling is and what the riches are of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. Verse number 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? See, you got to believe according to the working of his mighty power, not your weakness. It's according to his power. So see, whatever you face, whatever mountain's in your way, don't even worry about that mountain and stop praying for God to speak to it. When he told you to speak to it, I'm going to show you that in the word again here in a minute. But look, it's according to the working of his mighty power, not according to the problem you're facing. Got that? I want to preach on each one of these. Verse 20, I'm going somewhere today. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And now look at this. And seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. That's the position of ultimate favor and authority, the right hand of God. God Almighty reigns this morning from the throne of heaven. And sitting right beside him is Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's seated right there today at the right hand of God the Father, reigning with authority and all power. Woo! Glory to the Lord. See, there's a reason to be excited. Well, I don't know. Well, he's far above all principality, all power, all might, all dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And look at this. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things. And look what shows up and pops up here. The church. Somebody say the church. You make up the church. He's talking about you, the body of Christ. What has happened? He put all things under his feet. How many believe Jesus truly has all power this morning, huh? Well, did you know he's the head of the church? The church, the true church that he's building can't do anything different than what the head says. Just like your finger ain't going to do anything different than your head tells it to do. It can't. Your head is going to tell it. Some of you, since I've been preaching, you've been digging for gold. I saw it. I saw you. I saw him. I'm pointing out who it is. But your head told your finger, get up there. Get that. Mm. Get that on out of there. Well, we got Kleenex right there by. So next time use the Kleenex. It's all good. I love you. Bless you. Just don't wipe it under the seat. I told you I've been in church a long time. I've seen a lot of gross things. Imagine being a kid deciding you're going to take a nap under an orange pew on green shag carpet. And you look up and you see somebody's gum from who knows when. Tim Elliott knows about that car, but that's a real car. That's a real thing. I laid under there, I want to take a nap. You know, we had two and a half, three hour services back in the day. For a three year old, you get tired. I look up and see gum up under there. Goodness. Who has time for that in church? Well, a lot of people do. Because after all, they think it's just church. They don't understand. You came here to get infused with power. To get reminded of the place of authority where you sit today. Hey, he gave him to be head over all things. If Jesus has all power and he's the head, and even if you're the little bitty tiny toe now, you still have been put and positioned above all this other mess that goes on in life. That includes sickness, disease, depression, hurt feelings, every bit of it. I've been set up above it. How about you? Some of you better go ahead and shake yourself this morning. Well, but I'm dealing with, I know what you're dealing with. He knows what you're dealing with. He cares. He did not put you in a position of authority for you to lose. He puts you in a position of authority for you to win. Do I have any winners in the house today? (laughs) Might as well act like a winner. How many times have I told you? Just turn on the sports program. You'll see if it's basketball, whatever it is, hockey, anything, man. I don't even watch hockey. But I can tell you, even though I don't even understand hockey other than trying to throw a puck in a net, if I look at the crowd, I can tell you, well, by the jerseys and everything, if their team's winning or losing. Why? The losers look depressed. The winners? They'll kick over drinks, popcorn to go everywhere. 
they don't even care if they look like a hot mess to you. Because they care about winning. And it's so funny because in our society, winners, they can get away with almost anything. Like, I mean, you can act an absolute buffoon fool on national television. Everybody's like, man, that's just a fanatic for his team. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, look, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl or whatever, and people, they scan the crowd. And I mean, there's dudes up there, they're crying. Their painted faces leaking everywhere. <laughs> On oh, hundred and millions of the people watching that. And you look like a fool, but nobody cares. It's totally acceptable because, after all, his team just won some kind of trophy. I went to a playoff basketball game the other night. And I'm telling you, I saw two little towns play, and I looked at Garrett, and I said, I think the whole town from both sides is here. Those are tiny, tiny little towns. And the stands were packed, and nobody was quiet. You get them up in church, give God a shout of praise. Well, that's crazy. Your neighbor boy over there is playing basketball. What do you do? Come on, man! I'll tell you this, because you know when you play basketball and you're on offense, you're not supposed to be able to stand three seconds in the lane. And we were watching this. There was a guy on the row right behind us. And I'm telling you, the opposition, like let's say this is the lane in front of the pulpit. They would literally go, he'd go, three seconds, three seconds. Come on, ref. <laughs> and then I forgot like what team he was rooting for because I, was, you know, I didn't really care who won this game. And then I was like, oh, there's three seconds right there. Garrett's like, he's not going to say it's his team. <laughs> his guy was just standing there. And they didn't call another. He didn't yell at all. But I said, see, in our society, oh, that's acceptable, right? Why? All to win a game. Yet in life, God has called you to win. And your pastor's like, shout to God. You're like, oh, that's, that's a little too Pentecostal style for me. Man, I tell you what, you better start recognizing the position you're in. Well, unfortunately, we do have to stop right there. We are out of time today. However, if you would like to hear more from this series on how to win the fight of faith, you can head over to our website at accelerate.church.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find this message in its entirety, plus so many more that you can listen to throughout your week. But if you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We're located at 4400 South Crockett Street here in Amarillo, and our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Or you can write us, email us. We would love to hear from you. If we don't see you in person, we'll catch you on the next Accelerate Church television broadcast.